Pastures Broadcast with Bishop James Hansen Saki, Presiding Bishop of Christ Church International Group of Churches. Welcome to Green Pastures Broadcast with Bishop James Hansen Saki, Presiding Bishop of Christ Church International Group of Churches. Welcome to Green Pastures Broadcast with Bishop James Hansen Saki, Presiding Bishop of Christ Church International Group of Churches. We thank you for the privilege to come before your presence. We thank you for the ability to receive from you. We thank you for the blood that was shed. We thank you that you are sovereign and that in all things you still remain God. And tonight, Lord, as we gather before your holy presence, I pray in the name of Jesus that you anoint the teaching of your word. I pray let your word come as a double-edged sword that will penetrate and divide asunder soul and spirit and of every joint and marrow that it will minister judgment to the intents and thoughts of every heart. Let there be clarity in the teaching of your word. Let the word have free course tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pull down every stronghold and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that my hearers will be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Put your hands together wherever you are. And you're welcome to our international pulpit. This is the Christ Church International. And we believe that God is here. And tonight he will reach you by his word. Amen. Tonight I want to speak to you on a message I've entitled, The Qualities of an Intercessor. The Qualities of an Intercessor. It is very, very important that we never lose sight of the fact that the Christian faith is a faith. And that means that anything that is based on faith has got to believe in something that naturally doesn't make sense to humans, but it makes sense in the realm of the spirit. We must understand that one of the qualities of faith is prayer. Prayer is a reflection of our faith. Because how could you talk in a room or on the street or anywhere and you really physically can't see God but you have to go to him every day with either your eyes closed and you are addressing someone that if another person is observing you, you may appear to be crazy and out of your mind but it takes the ridiculous to see the miraculous. And so when you are dealing with God, our Christian faith itself was born out of the miraculous and of things that naturally don't make sense to humans. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 that the natural man, that is the unsaved man, the unspiritual man, the Bible says that the things of God are foolishness to them. Neither can they know them because the things of God are spiritually discerned. And one of the things that are spiritually discerned, which is part of the Christian faith, which is a very integral part of the Christian faith, is prayer. And prayer 
must be prayed in a particular way because God is the one who calls the shots on how we should pray to him, how we should serve him, and how he responds to us. Prayer may not make sense, but it works. Now, in the seasons in which we live, this calls for prayer. This calls for intercession. Its intercession is another form of prayer. There are many forms of prayer. Intercession is one of them. Intercession means to, to go in between God and another person or to stand in on behalf of another. The same meaning that we know literally is the same meaning except that in the case of the spirit, you stand in the gap either to stand in a prayer for yourself, your family or other people, your church, etc. So God is looking forward to intercessors and the scripture tells us that in Ezekiel 22 verse 30, God said that the sins of the land, the iniquities on the land, he is ready to destroy the land, but he's looking for at least if he finds one person who who will stand in prayer, who will stand in intercession, he will heal the land and he said he found down. May it be that when God is looking for an intercessor in these days of COVID-19 pandemic, may you be found to be an intercessor. Because anyone that is truly filled with the spirit of God will be drawn to the place of intercession. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 4 that when Jesus was baptized and he came up out of the water, the scripture said he was led of the spirit into the wilderness to fast and to pray so he was engaged in intercessory prayers for 40 days and 40 nights under the leading of the holy spirit it means that when we are filled with the holy spirit one of the hallmarks of the ministry of the holy ghost is to lead us into a place of prayer not just prayer that we pray for food but i'm talking about the type of intercessory prevailing prayers that brings heaven down to earth that changes the course of things it is in the place of intercession that the destinies of nations and the destinies of people are altered by prayer prayer may not make sense but it works however if we will pray strategically and pray according to the counsel of god we need to learn strategic intercession and the scripture teaches us that when we follow the Bible, we will see very great men and women that God used who themselves were great intercessors. And we will learn from one of them tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Because I believe that when we intercede, intercession makes us to see with the eye of God. And we begin to see possibilities which others don't see. It is in the place of prayer and intercession that God exchanges your weakness with his strength. Amen. The scripture tells us in Matthew that when Jesus interceded in Gethsemane, he prayed and an angel was sent from heaven to strengthen him to carry on praying. And the Bible says, and he prayed more earnestly and his sweat as it were were like great drops of blood. What a powerful example and model of intercession. And so as we look into scripture, things that go on on the face of the earth that we have no control over, you need to see God in prayer. And sometimes there are challenges that have been consistent. They are there and they are not moving. It takes a certain type of prayer to deal with it. It is intercession. Intercessory prayers are prayed until the answer comes. To, to put it briefly, intercessory prayers are praying this is the prayer that we pray we pray the same prayer topics over and over to the same god until the answer comes in jesus name because in the realm of the spirit there may be layers of challenges that you might be dealing with that you had no idea about we know about the story of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 and Daniel chapter 10. And the scripture said he interceded for 21 days until an angel came with the answer and said, the first day you began to pray, I was sent with the answer. But between heaven and earth, there was a prince that was ruling over the nation of Persia. This prince was not a human being. He could not have stopped an angel. But the Bible says this prince of Persia, that is a powerful satanic being, was able to intercept an angel of the Lord. And was able to hold the angel in battle for 21 days. But Daniel's consistent, persistent intercession was enough for God to send a reinforcement from the heavens to come and deal with this other 
demon or principality before the other angel could come through to Daniel. That tells you that in the realm of the spirit, things may be going on. And whatever the challenge is, don't stop praying. You need to learn the marks and the skills and the qualities of an intercessor. Amen. That is what breaks yokes. That is what brings deliverances. That is what sets the destinies of nations in the path of God. That is what will transform your family from that place of disadvantage to another place of advantage. It takes strategic intercessory prayers to get some things done. Amen. Prayer doesn't make sense, but it works. Amen. I will never stop repeating that statement because if we want to think about it, it will make sense. But spiritually, it makes sense. Yes, in Jesus' name. Amen. May every believer be an intercessor Amen. in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Tonight, I want us to learn from Moses. Moses was a very great intercessor. He learned to stand in the gap and to negotiate with God. I have found out that today's believers and Christians don't know exactly how to stay in the presence of God for prayer. Especially prayers of negotiation with God, you see, because intercession itself is not backing orders at God. Today's Christians have been read in a way they have been brought up in a way that just goes before the presence of the Lord, shout at God, command God to move. You can't him, command him to move. See, there must be a certain level of humility and respect in your intercession. Yes, and to learn to use the scriptures to negotiate with God, that is intercession. And most of the time, when you ask believers today to pray for up two hours or one hour on just asking God for mercy, they are struggling. But change the subject and say, bind demons. You see, they will bind demons for three hours. But we don't know how to actually negotiate with God, engage God, and talk to God. And when we study the scriptures, we see the great intercessors of the Bible. In the Bible, they are able to raise matters with God. Change the subject, raise it again, bring God's attention to something, skillfully negotiate uncompromisingly in the place of prayer. And I love Abraham. When Abraham was negotiating with God in intercession over Sodom, he kept on coming with alternatives. He said, would you destroy 10,000? Would you destroy 50,000? If, if you find 50,000 righteous people, would you destroy? The Lord said no. And he kept on beating the thing down until it came to 10. And to 10,000. And because he was then negotiating on behalf of one, one man. And he was doing that skillfully throughout. And then he would go in in humility and say, let not the Lord be angry. But because I'm just a man. And I'm, I understand that I'm dust and ashes. And then he will make a case again. And in all that we see, there was no binding of demons. But he was dealing with God. May we learn both in Jesus' name that we will know how to go to God when it's not about binding demons. And we will also know how to deal with the devil when we have to bind the devil. When we have to bind demons, we will bind. And we, may we be skillful in both ends because I see a deficiency on one hand. On one end, if we have to go to God and only seek him for his mercy over a matter for a long time. We just can't stay in there. We feel we are tired. We can hang in there and only ask for the mercies of God. Jesus went to Gethsemane and the scripture tells us that he only prayed one prayer topic. Matthew 26. He prayed only one prayer topic. Father, not my will. Your will be done. Three hours. That's all. He kept on doing that. And I pray that you will learn that skill in Jesus' name. There's something about intercession. And we want to look at Moses. Exodus chapter 32 and verses 1 to 14. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break of the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. Verse 4. And he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. And then they received the gold from their hand. And then they said, 
This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Verse 5. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they arose early the next day. They offered burnt offerings, brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat, to drink. They rose up and to play. Verse 7. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down quickly, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molding calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it. And said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people, and indeed they are a stiff naked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath <clears throat> may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. And I will make of you a great nation. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God. That's where he began his intercession. He pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your anger burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians eat and say, he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, turn your fierce wrath, O Lord, and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of, I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. Verse 14. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. The old King James says, so the Lord repented from the harm that he thought to do to his people. And the change of mind here was that a man's Actually, turn the heart of God. The scripture had already told us that God is sovereign and powerful and that when he opens, no one can shut. And when he shuts, no one can open. And when he makes up his mind, it will only take intercession to change the mind of God. And the Bible says that Moses was able to skillfully do this and God changed his mind. God took a decision to destroy the people because of what they have done, and yet Moses was able to stand in the gap until the matter was resolved. That is an intercessor. That is how God is expecting you as a believer to stand in the gap for your family, for the church, for the nations. The scripture says in Timothy, first of all, that intercessions be made for all men. And then he goes on to categorize all men. And he says, for kings, for those in authority, not those who are trying to come to authority, those that are in authority, Amen. you are supposed to stand as a believer, to stand in the gap for them. Pray for the nation that we will live a quiet and peaceable life. For the Bible says, this is the will of God. So we shall live a peaceable and quiet life. And so you see, intercession is crucial. And the Bible says, here that Moses employed some skills here which I want to talk us through. Number one, the first quality of an intercessor is that the intercessor must have a strong, intimate, and dynamic relationship with God. Strong, intimate, and dynamic relationship with God. Strong, intimate, and dynamic relationship with God. As we see from the scripture, Moses had that relationship with the father. That he could, he wasn't going to back off, even though the father made up his mind. Look at what the people have done. I'm going to kill all of them. I'm going to destroy all of them. I'm going to finish all these people. And I'm going to raise for you a new group, a new nation. That Moses, you will lead them. And he could still take the matter with God. He has a relationship with God. In fact, somewhere in the scriptures, I think in Exodus chapter 33 verse 11. Exodus 33, 11. I just want you to look at something briefly there. Exodus 33, 11. Exodus 
Exodus 3, 11 says, So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. That's the depth of relationship they have. Hallelujah. The Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. What a blessing. So Moses had a strong, intimate, and dynamic relationship with God. As a believer, you mustn't just be, as I always say, don't just be born again. You must grow to know this God and develop a strong, intimate relationship with God. In fact, in the account in Genesis 18 concerning Sodom and Gomorrah, God said, my plan is to destroy Sodom, but shall I hide from Abraham? The scripture called him a friend of God. Shall I hide from Abraham what I wanted to do? So let me go down, visit Abraham, pay him a visit, and we have a chat. That is the level of relationship. How intimate is your relationship with the one you call a father? Because the, the people on earth that we call fathers, one of the qualities that someone is really your father is that you develop an intimate relationship with that person either biological or spiritual, to the point that you know that you can access him or her at any time. One who is a mother and a father, we can access them and we are comfortable in their presence, but we know that we must meet certain standards. We build a relationship through his word, through his word and through prayer, daily in his word, his word, prayer, and living a life that is in line with his word, you are actually getting to the point where his heartbeat becomes your heartbeat. The Bible says when Gabriel visited Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, he said, Daniel, thou beloved of the Lord. Again, look at the usage of such words. They had an intimate relationship with God. You have the Holy Spirit in you. Intentionally build an intimate relationship with God is the first quality of an intercessor. And you are not limited in any way, geography or space. You will be able to immediately tune in and communicate with the Father. Moses had that relationship. It was intimate and it was a dynamic relationship. It's not a dull relationship. It's not a one-way relationship. It's not a relationship that is only based on need. So you don't talk to God in the morning. You are busy with all other things, but you don't talk to him. In the afternoon, no talk. Evening, no talk. When you're about to sleep, it depends on your mood. If you are feeling afraid, that's when you open Psalm 23 and command some few words and sleep. But it must be dynamic. You shouldn't have a relationship with someone you call a father that you only call when you are in need. That's not proper. God wants us to have intimate, dynamic relationship. And the scripture says this was the case with Moses. So Moses had that relationship with the father. The second mark of an intercessor or the second quality of an intercessor is that the intercessor has the ability to hear from God. Every believer must be able to hear from God. Because the spirit of God is in you. And the spirit of God in you, one of his job descriptions as Jesus promised us in the book of John, chapter 40 and chapter 16. Jesus said that when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will show you things to come. He will not speak of his own. But whatever he hears the father say, he will say to you. So the spirit speaks. In Acts chapter 13, the Bible says, as Paul and Silas and, his, and Barnabas, sorry, and his friends were in prayer. The Bible says there were certain prophets and teachers in those days, Acts chapter 13. And as they waited on God in prayer and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas. So the Spirit of God speaks. The Spirit of God has always been speaking. And the mark of an intercessor who will be used of God to change the course of events in the nations of the world, in the church, in ministry, in your family, is that you must be able to hear from God. And you activate that because when the Spirit of God is in you, you need to create the platform for the Spirit of God to speak. And prayer is the platform. Prayer is the atmosphere. The Word of God is the atmosphere. And holy living, these three combined creates a few a, a nice and a welcoming environment for the spirit of God to speak believers must be able to hear from God and when a prophecy comes you are already filled with the Holy Ghost and you'll be able to discern that among all the gifts 
we are told prophecy is what must be judged. So it must be scrutinized. And the scripture says, let the prophets judge. Let the prophets prophesy and let another judge. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So the scripture tells us about these things. And it is very, very important that every believer must be able to hear from God. So the scripture says Moses could hear from God. Exodus chapter 32, verse 7 to 9. 32 is the whole scripture we read up to verse 14. And I'm just speaking all the verses bit by bit to tell you what happened there. And so the second mark or quality of an intercessor is that the intercessor must be able to hear from God. You see, prayer is a dialogue. It's not a monologue. If you speak to God, he will speak back. But how tuned are you in the spirit to download information from the throne room of grace? When God speaks, how would you hear? He speaks to us by the spiritual gifts that are in us. Word of knowledge, word of wisdom, descending of spirits. These are all means by which the spirit of God speaks to the believer. So you need to activate them. You see, heavenly waters cannot flow through polluted channels. That is why righteousness is a very important thing to maintain. So that you can hear from God. The Lord has been speaking. But are we able to hear? Moses could hear. The Bible says, and the Lord said to him. That means they communicate. He could hear. The Lord said to him, the people you have brought, they have corrupted themselves. I pray that you hear from God. I pray that your ears be oiled by the Holy Ghost. I pray in the name of Jesus, you will not be deaf to the Spirit of God. The Lord will speak through visions and dreams. He said, if there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, I speak to them in visions and I reveal myself in dreams. And so we need to come to that place where as believers, we grow to the point of hearing from God. And God speaks. The third thing, quality of an intercessor is that they have the knowledge of the promises of God in Jesus name they have the knowledge of the promises of God in Jesus mighty name they have knowledge of the promises of God that means that they know the word of God and they know what God has promised Exodus 32 verse 11 to 13 Exodus 32 11 to 13 When Moses was interceding, he said to the Lord that it was you that made a covenant. It was you that made a promise. They knew the word of God. The promises of God are in the word of God. So when you have the word of God, you don't let another read the word to you. You must read the word. Every believer must be a student of the word. Discipline yourself to read the word. In that case, you are not deceived. Because when you read the word... You are able to know the promises of God. You are also able to know when God speaks. Because if you communicate with someone for a long time, if you see a letter from the person, you know he was the one who wrote it. There are certain terms and certain phrases you know that, no, he doesn't use these words. Someone wrote this for me. You know, so in the same way, I just want you to understand that God would want you to know his promises in Jesus' name. 32 verse 11 Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Hallelujah. Amen. And then he says to them, why should the Egyptians say that you have brought them out to harm them, to kill them, turn your face from this anger, And change your mind. Then he says, remember the promises you made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Moses knew. He had knowledge of the promises of God. The intercessor must have a knowledge of the promises of God in Jesus' name. The fourth thing is that he understands also the covenants of God. He understands the covenants of God. Because you see, you can't deal with God until you are able to break down his covenants. Because God... The Bible says that he never changes his mind regarding his covenants. The Bible says that his covenant will he not break. And that which has gone out of his lips, he will not alter. And those, because of that, when you are dealing with God, he's the God of covenants. He said he will not break his covenant. He remembers his covenants. To the third and fourth generation, God remembers covenants. So when Moses went to him, when God had made up his mind, In order to skillfully negotiate, you must be knowledgeable of his covenants so that you can take his covenant to him to make a case. 
in the book of Isaiah, he said, come to my courts and prove your strong reasons why I should bless you. And the strong reason to take to him, it must be something based on his covenant, not on feelings. Because in this case, they have already broken his law. In fact, the, the law he was giving to Moses on the mountain was one of them was, you shall have no other gods before me. It was even the first one. I am the Lord, the God that brought you out of the land of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. And by a few minutes or seconds or hours, by the time Moses came down, the people had a God beside our God. They have broken the first commandment. And so God was already in a legal position to really deal with them. And yet Moses was able to lift out of the law, out of the covenants of God, out of the matter before him. He was able to take a clause in the constitution of God and send it to him and say, Lord, remember your covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And because of that, you need to reconsider your decision. Your, he said, you must know the covenant and the plans of God. God has plans and most of his plans are based on certain covenants. When you have an idea of that as an intercessor, you'll be able to know what the timings of things are in the scheme with God. And Abraham, Isaac and Jacob had certain covenants with God. God had a covenant with them which were supposed to be everlasting covenants. God said, I will bring them to a land and I will bless them there. He told Abraham that. He reaffirmed that to Isaac and he affirmed that to Jacob. So how could he change it? And the Bible said, Moses reminded God in the verse number 13. He says, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self. You see how he's winding God up. He's really putting God in a very difficult position because God will have to watch over his word and perform it. And God will have to remember that he's a God of justice. And here he is, his word, his covenant was being taken to him. Not only knowledge of his promises, but now Abraham, Moses is taking the covenant and lifting it to say, remember that you did this and you swore by your own self. The scripture said when he found no one greater than himself, he swore by himself. And he says that to them, I will multiply your descendants. So if you kill these people and raise from me another group of people, they can't be the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That will be a violation of your covenant, O oh Lord. And he says, and you promise by that covenant that you multiply their descendants as the stars of heaven and all this land. That you have spoken, you said you will give to their descendants and they shall inherit it forever. So if you kill them here, Lord, you have disturbed your own covenant. And your word says your covenant you will not break. So Lord, remember your covenant and reconsider your position. Reconsider the decision. And the Bible says that thing worked. Hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. Amen. And so the Lord relented. Amen. That was a strong case. But that is an intercessor who had no Bible before him. Praying to God, talking to God, and was able to bring out all these things because he's well versed in the word. So he knew the covenants and plans of God. Number five, he was selfless. An intercessor must be selfless. You can't be selfish and become a successful intercessor. Many times God may wake you up to pray for certain people and not your own self. Verse 10. Now therefore, let me alone. That's what God is saying. Let me alone that I may consume them, destroy them, and I will make of you a great nation. So, can you imagine? The people were very difficult leading them. And now you get a good offer from God that all these guys who have been giving you hard time, all these people you have been leading and they are difficult to lead. If you have pastored before, you understand what I'm saying. Very difficult, stiff-necked people. Move left, we won't move left. Sit down, we won't sit down. 
What is it? Are we in kindergarten? Why should we lift our hands and sit down? All those things. Follow the vision. We won't. We will follow from the other church where we came from. We will do what they are doing. That's a different, they are carrying a different ark. This place, we carry a different ark. The ark must be carried differently. The Lord will tell the Moses to lead the church in a particular way. Now, so here he was. When he says, go, God says, I'm going to feed you guys. But you will have to go out every day, get manna according to the size of your family. And then when you finish, next day, go. But on the seventh day, on the seventh day, no one should go out. Take double on the sixth day. On the seventh day, no one should go out. Check the scriptures. On the seventh day, some people still went out to look for manna. The scripture says, keep the manna. Eat all. Don't hoard any of them. Some people hoarded it. And the Bible says it stank. You know, it's difficult to lead them. And every stage of the way, they will complain. They will grumble. They will say things. And Moses had enough of those things. And yet, with all these challenges already, God comes with a good offer and says, you see the congregation who have been disturbing you, I'm going to kill all of them. That's why you would have said amen. But that is not the heart of a genuine man of God. The Bible said, Moses pleaded. He didn't accept the offer. He pleaded, Lord, keep them alive. Let's get to the promised land with what you said from the beginning. Can you imagine that in the long run, the same people made him lose the right to enter the promised land. And their descendants rather went, oh, this is not fair. But I'm telling you, that is still the heart of an intercessor. The scripture said he was selfless. You need to be selfless. Sometimes you may pray for hours and it's got nothing to do about you, but it's about the people. It's about your family. It's about the nation. It's about the community. It's about the salvation of that brother, that sister, that cousin, that friend, or that neighbor across the road. You need to stand in the gap and wage war in prayer and pray for their salvation. At least if there's nothing to pray about, there is one thing that is constant. The Bible says God does not wish that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So you can take that scripture and go to God and start lifting neighbors into the hands of the Lord. Amen. Call them by name and cry out to God and pray for their salvation. That's an intercessor. He's not selfish. May you not be selfish in the name of Jesus. Oh, I'm feeling very sleepy. That's the time to wake up and pray. And if you have walked with God, you understand. At the time that you want to dose off, that's where you receive an inspiration to pray for Sister B and Mr. W and all of them. And then you have to wake up and pray. You are selfless. Because if, if Netflix wakes you up, you will wake up. When you are told that the next series is starting at 2 a.m., you will wake up. But stand in the gap from 12 to 2. Mm, I feel tired. Lord, you know. You start yawning. You start feeling, you start feeling as if you have you are developing symptoms. This is when we say developing symptoms. We don't mention what symptoms. Everybody assumes and knows. <laughs> May you not develop symptoms when you must intercede. <laughs> In the name of Jesus. The destiny of your family hangs on your shoulders. You didn't just become born again. You are not receiving this teaching for fun. God wants you to address some things in your family. Things about your children. Things about the destiny of the marriage. There are some issues. Arguments can't solve them. But prayer will solve them. Amen. Amen. There are some things there. They are consistent. They are nagging issues. You stop the arguments. Stop the shouting match. It will help it. Get on your knees. And Amen. deal with it. In the name of Jesus. Moses said. I won't take the offer Lord. You have to let this be done. Amen. He was selfless. And you could see that it was so impactful that God himself protested and said, leave, leave me alone. That means that Moses was hindering him by the intercession. He said, let me alone. Let me do this. It means that, I mean, he could do it. Why did he say, leave me alone? Leave me alone. That means Moses' intercession was enough. And his arguments were strong, rooted in scripture, rooted in the covenants of God, rooted in the spirit that God couldn't do, couldn't do much about it, but to say, this guy is too tough for me. Say, so leave me alone. May it be that when you stand in the gap, and destruction and wickedness is determined against your nation and families, God will look at you and say, okay, your prayers are too strong. Your position is very strong. I will respond. His intercession was determining the destiny of the whole nation and the whole church or the whole group of people. He was selfless. 
selfless. Number six, tenacity and resilience. The intercessor must have tenacity and resilience. That means that you don't give up in the place of prayer. You, you have prayer stamina and, you know, I call it stubborn faith. You hang in there. You have got the resilience, the tenacity, the ability to hang in there, to stand in there. You have the stamina, the fortitude to hold on there until the matter is resolved. You are not just hanging in there, but you are actually arguing your case strongly in the place of prayer and holding the horns of the altar and believing God and applying all kinds of prayers and intercessions to get it done. And the Bible says that when he hung in there with tenacity and resilience, the matter was settled up on the mountain before he let God go. That is the nature of intercessors. They are able to hold on until the answer comes. And the scripture tells us in verse 14 that because Moses would not give up, he hung in there, he was resolute. He was still negotiating with God. He wasn't allowing God to change the subject. He was still coming with strong reasons based on the covenant of God, based on the word of God. The Bible says, so the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. God changed his mind. And now Moses could go. What I'm sharing with you is that that level, the sixth point, brings you to the place where the matter must be resolved in the place of prayer before you back off. You may break for a day to go to work or do something, but you come back on the same prayer topic and take it back to God and continue from where you left off, making your case and holding God by his word and continue until in the place of prayer, the matter is determined before you leave the matter. And that's exactly what happened here. Moses did not relent until the matter was resolved on the mountain before he came down. I pray that you have the grace to hang in there till the matter is resolved. The Bible tells us of, his, of Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 18. That the Bible says that from the verse 41. That after he had gone to the Mount Camel to pray. He heard the sound of abundance of rain. And being a prophet he could tell that this is happening in the realm of the spirit. But in the natural it wasn't raining. And the Bible says he went up to the Mount Camel. And he prayed intensely. The scripture says it was an effectual fervent prayer that brought results. And the scripture says he hung in there in prayer until there was a cloud this time. Like the feast of a man. And he knew the matter is now settled. The Bible says it was the seventh time. We don't know how many hours made up the first time. Before he sent his servant. But he prayed and prayed and prayed. Then he sent a servant to go and check whether anything has changed in the skies. And the servant came back and said nothing. And he continued to pray and pray and pray and then sent again. The scriptures describes that in James and says that Elijah was a man like us. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it did not rain for three and a half years. And he prayed earnestly that it might rain. And the Lord sent the rain. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. On the seventh occasion, there was a sign. Something changed. An ordinary prayer of a man was able to move clouds in the sky. When there were no clouds for three and a half years, his prayer was able to bring physical manifestation of a, of a, of a, of a cloud. That tells you that prayer may not make sense, but it has spiritual implications. And the scripture says in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 that the things that we see are not a product of things that can be seen. The unseen produces the seen. And it is prayer that brings things from the realm of the spirit to manifest in the natural. And Elijah prayed the matter was settled on Mount Carmel before he moved. And if we look at Jesus, we see the same trend. And if we look at Abraham in Genesis 18, we see the same thing. Chapter 18, verse 20 to 33. God came and said, shall I hide from Abraham that which I want to do? And the Bible says, God said, I'm going to destroy Sodom because of what has happened. And Abraham realized that he had a nephew down there. And the nephew will have children, etc. So he said to God, but would you destroy a whole nation if you find 50,000? God said, I won't destroy for the sake of 50,000. He said, will you destroy the righteous with the unrighteous? God said, no, I won't do that. He said, okay, so how about if you find 40,000? 
Okay, how about if you find 30,000? What about if you find 10,000? What about if you find? And he continued to scale it down. And each of them, he punctuated his sentences by saying, let not the Lord be angry. The God of the universe, who am I but dust and ashes? Let me one more time make a plea. Let me one more time make a case. And he continued to do so until the Bible says the Lord gave him a firm assurance. I will not destroy. If I find one righteous person, I won't destroy. And the Bible says, and the Lord left off. What an intercessor. And because of that, angels were sent to evacuate Lot out of Sodom and his family. Because someone interceded and stood in the gap, was resilient and was not ready to drop the matter until God. Again, you see Abraham going to God and petitioning God and saying, would the God who is righteous and the judge of all living, will he really destroy the righteous with the unrighteous? What a way to make a case. May the Lord give you the grace to learn to skillfully negotiate in the place of prayer called intercession in the name of Jesus. And so again, you see God did not leave until the matter was resolved in the place of prayer. If you look at Jacob, his name was changed from Jacob to Israel, not by deep pole, by all night prayer, intercessory prayer, Amen. until God himself pleaded and said, let me go. The man was able to hold on. He said, bless me. If you bless me, I will let you go. The man held on because he had a case. That the blessings of three generations were hanging on him. That the covenant blessings that was pronounced over Abraham, that was passed on to Jacob, that was passed on to Isaac, which Isaac himself laid hands on him, Jacob, and pronounced those blessings. He applied all, took it to God that night in prayer, and said, you must activate these blessings that you covenanted with Abraham and that of my father Isaac. And according to that which you also told my mother before I was born, that I will be the head. And he made a case. And the Bible says when it was getting to daybreak, God protested and said, let me go. And he wouldn't let him until God wounded him. And the Bible says he began to limp. May God help you to have what it takes to hang in the place of prayer. Hold on to God based on his word until the matter is resolved. It is changed from the mountain in Jesus' name. The subject matter was settled in prayer before it manifests in the natural. And finally... Point number seven, the seventh quality of an intercessor, holiness. 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 First Peter chapter three and the verse number three to five. Sorry, first, first Peter chapter three, verse five to twelve. Verses five to twelve. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God, they adorned themselves they, as they were subject to their own husbands. I love it whenever the scripture says, own husbands. <laughs> Let the man you are with should be your own husband. Amen. And that woman you are with should be your own wife. Amen. Glory. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory. Your own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him my Lord. Eh? Modern day wives have been calling their husbands sugar and toffee. Chocolate and honey. These things are too sweet. It may lead to problems in health. Call him my Lord. It changes the game. I tell you, change the game. We'll deal with marriage one of these days. But it changes the game, my Lord. And the scripture says, whose daughters you are. As long as you do well and are not afraid of anything. Verse 7. In the same way, husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. You must have an understanding and knowledge of the makeup and operations of that wonderful entity called woman. And he says, as unto a weaker vessel and as being hers together. You are hers together. She is not inferior. Leadership has only been given to you as the man. But you are equal in the eyes of God. He says you are hers together. Of the grace of life. So that your prayers are not hindered. So you see there are certain things. It doesn't matter how much you go and shout at God. The Bible says if you are not treating each other 
properly as husbands and wives, your prayer can be hindered. And the scripture says, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion of one another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Verse 9. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. That is insult for insult. But contrarywise, knowing that you are called unto blessing, bless that you should inherit a blessing. Verse 10. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no lies. Let him hate evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to the prayers of the righteous. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. This is enough. He says the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. And his ears are opened to the prayers of the righteous. So when we are being asked to live holy lives. It is not an infringement on our freedom. But actually it is a strategic position. To position yourself in the place of prayer. For God to hear your prayer. It's so clear that the reason why God asks us to live holy lives is for us to be in a good position that he can bless us, that he can hear our prayer because his ears are not deaf that they cannot hear. His eyes are not blind that he cannot see. Isaiah 59, he says the eyes of the Lord are not blind that he can see. His hands are not short that they cannot save, but your iniquities have separated him from you. And so the scripture says here that for God to hear our prayers, his eyes are over the righteous. His ears are opened to the prayers of the righteous. For righteousness, we have all received righteousness. When you are born again, you are righteous based on the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. Now after we have received that which the scripture says has been imputed to us. Righteousness has been imputed to us. That means we have been credited with it. Our accounts have been credited with the righteousness of Christ. So what Jesus did on the cross was an act of righteousness. And based on that blood, anytime the father sees that blood, he sees you righteous. Amen. So we have the righteousness of God that has been imputed to us. Now. After we have received that, we are supposed to walk in holiness that maintains the righteousness. So that is the difference between holiness and righteousness. Righteousness, you can't do anything. We are not saved by our own righteousness. We are saved by the grace of God and the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. But when that has now been procured for you, it is common sense to carry yourself in a way not to destroy what was purchased for you. And the way to handle that is what is called holiness. Amen. Amen. So holiness is living your life in line with the scriptures, Amen. with the word of God. Amen. So when the Bible says don't commit adultery and fornication and theft and all of those things. These are all things we must not do to maintain the righteousness. These are holy living that maintains the righteousness that was purchased for you. Hallelujah. Amen. If there's no need for these things, then the scriptures will not be talking about them. A vast portion of the New Testament addresses holy living. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And if that is because we are saved and it's forever like that and we don't need to, then what's the big deal? Why can't we live our lives the same way as unbelievers? What's the difference? And that's why holiness is an important aspect. Amen. The Bible says without holiness, no man can see the Lord. And the scripture we just read says that your prayers, God's eyes are on the righteous and his ears are opened to the prayers of righteous people. And that is why it is one of the most important qualities of an intercessor. You can't go to God with sin in your life. You can't go to God and shout at God, just leave at, it's not going to work. You won't reach certain levels in God. A lot of you, your prayers are being hindered by the devil himself because there's nothing that makes a difference. We are like the sons of Sceva in the book of Acts. That these guys who are not born again, they heard that demons are being cast out by Paul. And so they too, they caught a man who was possessed with an evil spirit. And they said to the man, seven of them, they went to the house of this guy who has been possessed by demons. And they said, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. You see, you don't have a relationship with him. Yes, sir. 
In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, we command you to come out. And the demon spoke back and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, by you, who are you? And the Bible says that one man, full of demons, leapt upon them, and he beat them until they fled the house naked. Seven men were beaten by one man. Demon power. When you don't have righteousness with God, when you don't have holiness that maintains the righteousness, in the realm of the spirit, you are mincemeat for witches and wizards. You are, you, are, you are easy to be taken and destroyed. You don't have any credibility in the realm of the spirit. When you lift your voice in prayer, it carries no power. It carries no credibility. It's not just the use of the name of Jesus. There must be preparation as well. In the name of Jesus. Those guys use the name of Jesus. The demon beat them up. Many of you, your prayers are, being, are bouncing back because demons are just slapping it back. You carry no weight. Tonight I pray in Jesus' name that the spirit of the fear of the Lord will come upon you. And that you will develop a relationship of holiness and righteous living with God. Through his word. Apply the principles of the word. I leave you tonight with this understanding that God is a righteous God. That God is a righteous God. That God answers prayer. But there are certain things that we must do to qualify. To take it higher. To make sure that we are reaching God. At the level we need to reach him. And to get results that we must get in the mighty name of Jesus. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil. May when you lift your voice, may you have credibility in the realm of the spirit. May Jehovah hear you. Amen. I pray that you will grow in your spiritual walk with God. That these seven qualities of an intercessor will become part of your daily life. That anytime you go to God, you apply all these things until they become part of you. That unconsciously you begin to apply them in the place of prayer. May you not be selfish in Jesus' name. May the Spirit of God lead you into the place of prayer. Tonight I want you to lift your voice wherever you are. And I want you to pray that God will help you. Of these seven qualities that will be evident in your life. Do we are living in a season where we need genuine intercessors to bring this COVID-19 to an end. We need men and women of God that know God, that won't be toying around with sin. It doesn't matter gift and abilities. There is something about foundation that has got to do with holiness that gives you credibility in the realm of the spirit. Pray for these seven qualities to be manifested in your life. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Tonight, Lord Jesus. Oh, lift your voice and pray wherever you are. That these seven qualities shall become part of you. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Strong and intimate relationship with the Lord. And knowledge of the promises of God. That you could hear from God. Receive the anointing. Receive the grace. Let there be a stirring in your spirit. Let there be a stirring in our spirits. By the gifts of the spirit. By the gifts of the spirit. To hear from God. By dreams and visions. By word of knowledge. Word of wisdom. Descending of spirits. In the name of Jesus. Open and close visions. Audible voices. That you will hear God. In the name of Jesus. Receive the discipline of the spirit. In the name of Jesus. That you know the knowledge. You have the knowledge of the promises of God. In Jesus name. And knowledge of the covenants. And plans of God. That you will be selfless. In the name of Jesus. That you have resilience. In the name of Jesus. And that you walk in holiness. In the name of Jesus. Holy Ghost, I pray. Overshadow your people now. As they hear the sound of my voice. Let there be the movement of the Spirit now. Draw them into the place of prayer. As you did from the beginning. You move Jesus into the place of intercession. For 40 days and 40 nights. Oh, Sibli Atakabaha. Receive fresh oil. Receive fresh mantle. 
receive the mantles of an intercessor. I pray in the name of Jesus, the Lord lead you. May there be changes from tonight in your prayer. In the name of Jesus. Spirit of God, we thank you tonight. Holy Spirit, brood over your people tonight. Let there be fresh unctions to pray. Let there be stirrings of the Spirit, Lord. Tonight, let there be grace to pray. I bind every spirit of spiritual laziness, spiritual procrastination when it comes to prayer. In the name of Jesus, tonight let the Lord deliver you from prayerlessness. The Holy Ghost draw you to the place of prayer tonight in Jesus' name. Father, tonight we thank you. As many as have heard this word, I ask that you touch them. I pray that you bring them to the place where they can be effective intercessors in the name of Jesus. On behalf of nations, on behalf of churches, on behalf of Christians, on behalf of unbelievers, on behalf of their families, in the name of Jesus, tonight let this word they have heard, let it transform their prayer lives. In Jesus' name, we request your help, Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray, fill every life here. Fill everyone hearing me. Anoint them in a new way. In the name of Jesus, we are living in seasons where it calls for serious intercession. And may God raise men and women as a result of this message that from tonight oh god they will pray with the might of god for they that wait upon the lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not be weary they will walk and not faint in the name of jesus i pray let them receive such an impartation tonight in jesus mighty name and we stand in intercession tonight over the nations of the world we invoke your word in Psalm 33, verse 18 to 19. The Lord, you will deliver our souls from death and keep your people alive in famine. Tonight, I pray in the name of Jesus, deliver the lives of doctors and frontline workers from death, from COVID-19 in the name of Jesus. Let the wickedness of the wicked disease be brought to an end tonight. According to your word in Psalm 7 verse 9, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray keep your people alive in famine. According to Psalm 33 and the verse 18 to 19, keep us alive in famine. Keep members of our church alive in famine. Keep all those that are listening, Lord, keep them alive in family. In famine, keep their families alive. Keep their relatives alive. Keep everything alive. In the name of Jesus, everyone that has been marked out to be killed by this disease, in the name of Jesus, we terminate that assignment. In the name of Jesus, we hinder this spirit. According to the word, in Psalm 91 verse 6, that we will not be afraid of the pestilence that walks in darkness. Whatever gives it legs to walk in darkness, whatever aids it to spread than it must be we bind that spirit now every spirit that has taken advantage of the situation to deploy this disease across places we terminate the assignment of these spirits spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places we come against you by the name of jesus 
And by the blood of Jesus, we command this disease to leave the face of the earth. Father, be merciful. We are your people called by your name. And when we humble ourselves to pray, you will hear from heaven and you will heal the land. Even if you are the one behind this, according to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 13 to 14, that if my people who are called by my name said, if I shut up heaven and there be no rain, and if I send locusts to the land, that they devour the land, and I send epidemics of pestilences, it is the people who are called by his name. Tonight we are your people, called by your name, purchased by the blood. In the name of your son Jesus, we stand upon the unfailing integrity of your word, O oh Lord, and we pray, forgive the sins of the nations. Heal the land, Lord, according to your word. Let this be swift. Let this be swift save lives deliver people deliver families deliver the nations of the world from the devastating effect of this COVID-19 virus in the name of Jesus father we thank you tonight that everyone hearing me meet them at the point of their need turn things around for them keep them alive in family honor your word in Jesus name amen and amen hallelujah we give God the praise and all the honor in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I believe you have been blessed. Let us know that you have been blessed. In Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, we want to pray over our offerings wherever we are. We want to pray that the Lord God will receive these seeds that we sow. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we pray. The Lord God Almighty, you will hear us. We commit our offerings into your storehouse. We bring it before you as a sign of our worship of you. We return to you that which you gave to us. And Lord God, we honor you this with this seeds. And we ask that Lord, you watch over your word and perform it. Multiply graces unto your people according to your word. In Jesus' name. Let there be no one that will lack in Jesus' name. And those who don't have to give, Lord, I pray. Remember them. Provide for them that they'll be blessed to give by faith. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless all of you. And I thank God for your lives. We will be coming back again on Sunday. And the time, it's 9 a.m. UK time. Make time with your family and friends. Call them to connect on YouTube and on Facebook. And I believe that you'll be blessed in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Let's receive the benediction. Now the Lord bless you all and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his great countenance on you and give you peace. May Jehovah remember you. None of you will die before your time. I pray that you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. May Jehovah himself open the heavens and preserve your lives and keep you alive in famine and provide for you. May the word you have heard tonight not depart from your spirit. I pray that you'll be able to walk in it. And according to the hymn writer, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he will shed on our way. I pray that you will be a blessing as a result of this in the name of Jesus. May the Lord remember all of you, your children, and that which concerns you. May Jehovah fight for you. And may God contend with those who contend with you. In Jesus' most excellent and holy name. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Let's share the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Be with you tonight and forevermore. You are blessed with an irrevocable blessing. To increase and to influence. Amen. Bye-bye. been a broadcast of Green Pastures with Bishop James Hansen Saki of the Christ Church International Group of Churches located in the United Kingdom, Switzerland, Ghana, and USA. For further information, please contact us on telephone plus 447376355621 on the web www.christchurches.org Facebook Christ Church International Christ Church, changing lives, fulfilling destinies on the foundation of God's Word.